Coming to you from our opulent and luxurious 4x8 refurbished broom closet at the National Headquarters in Indianapolis. With duct tape, studio lights, and a mic that you barely can hear, we hope to entertain and educate you. This is the Tango Alpha Lima Podcast. They call me crazy because I'm facing all my giants. They try to scare me into thinking I can't fight it. They tell me I should never even think of trying. But that's just me. I'm going to live out in defiance. Hello, 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 and welcome back to the Tango Alpha Lima Podcast. I am your host, Mark Seavey, Special Projects Council for the National Judge Advocates uh, Office here at our national headquarters in Indianapolis, although I am at home today. I'm joined by, we'll start with Jeff Daly of the Michigan Dailies, currently in Hollywood, California. Jeff, how's the day going so far, buddy? I love my day. I got to spend time with you amazing people earlier and our amazing guest. And now I'm super excited to get this show on the road. I see that you have an entire sheaf of papers there. And I'm assuming you printed out all the love letters that came into our email. I... I, now, this is all about our episode, but I did include every love letter every, that I received. It's right, listed there alphabetically. At, at, it's <laughs> phenomenal the way you've done that. Uh, yes. Ashley, do you have any female friends you don't really like that we can hook Jeff up with? Plenty. Because it's, it's getting sad. It's getting sad. We need to hook no, the man. Kidding. We need to hook the brother up. <laughs> well. Jeff, would you consider a girl oh, from Ohio? Yeah. Ooh. Now, funny story. There was a girl that I met online. She lived by the beach, which is, uh, I would rather date someone that lived across the country than live by the beach because the person across the country would never ask you to come over on a Tuesday. So she lived by the beach and she was from Ohio. So I told her one of those, either one of those things they could handle on their own, but both of them, it's just too much. I'm I'm sure that was a gem of a conversation and I hope you recorded it. Because that would be spectacular. <laughs> Ashley, how's everything going with you, though? I'm good. Good. I'm well. I'm you well. Do? You do? I've you got see? lots of things that I'm working on. Nice. So, yes. Very yes. good. I'm feeling, I'm feeling very sinister. If you see, I, I brought my friend today. Where did I'm you feeling get... extra eccentric. Where so did you get I this, anyway? This. You know what? Remember how we both like antiquing? Yeah. I picked this gem up in Virginia. Wow. <laughs> well, yeah, and I put lights and stuff in it, and I just was experimenting with the flowers. So, yeah, so for, for everyone who's just listening to this, it's um, it's literally a hollow glass head. And it's decorative, and it's kind of cool. And I she's referencing probably... something she's holding, not Jeff Daly. I want to note that. Correct. For Correct. those listening. For everyone listening, yes. His oh. hat is not entirely empty. There are there are little it's actually birds. It's really creepy. Not, like, now that I'm really looking at it, I'm like, wow. I bought that with my own money. <laughs> Good mm-hmm. for you. Good for me. That's disposable income right there. Yep. You're living anyway, large. I'm well. Let's Good. get into it, y'all. Well, this so. will be our last uh, official podcast of February, which is, everyone knows, is Black History Month. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we will be devoting our uh, most of our stories today to African American history, particularly among military personnel, since that's obviously what we discuss. So, uh, without further ado here, we're going to start today with Ashley. Ashley, you will go first for topic one. The first story that we have on the docket today is about an exceptional gentleman, age 65. He was the first black four-star admiral in the Navy's history, serving as the commander for the U.S. Pacific Fleet and the U.S. Strategic Command, where he oversaw nuclear weapons, nuclear, nuclear, nuclear weapons before retiring in 2017. His name is Cecil Haney, 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 excuse me, Cecil Haney, um, you know, I I just want to take a pause, so, you know, we are looking at and, you know, touching on stories for Black History Month. And, you know, there's been a lot of conversations this past year. We've, we've had a lot of stuff go on in this country. And, 
you know, uh, racial injustice is out there, and I really firmly believe that there are a lot of trailblazers, specifically black Americans who have been in our arms, who are doing amazing, amazing work. And, and Cecil is one of these individuals who recalls in this story, um, you know, when he first went to, you know, Navy Academy was, you know, folks criticized him and said, oh, the only reason you're here is because of a quota system. And, you know, I, I find that to be incredibly heartbreaking. And the fact that, you know, we still face racism today as a whole in America, and especially black Americans. So for someone as exceptional as Cecil, he still believes that there's work to be done. And I agree with him. I think that across the board, there has to be work done. And I know that the... Um, the Navy has additionally put out a task force regarding, you know, diversity and within recent ports in the month, you know, looking at the inclusion efforts. Um, they're, they're admirable in respects, as the article states, but, you know, we're still falling short from adequately addressing societal changes. So I'm going to open it up to my colleagues uh, about our first story about Cecil. Yeah, there was a, there was a quote in here that I like. He said, um, I'm a big believer that you have to look at best case, but you also have to look at worst case, he said. And although it can be easy to get wrapped up in the rah-rah of institution, any organization has things to work on. And that's no different from the Navy, from the American Legion, from any other thing. And, you know, I, I know that I went to the Citadel um, and the Citadel was, you know, a Southern military college. And so I know that we venerate the first african-american who made it through the citadel they're naming a new building after him um so yeah there's always work that can be done i don't think anyone is, is flawless but uh yeah i mean the work continues jeff i think uh, one of the things because first of all th this gentleman is 65 years old so he's not ancient by any means and uh, one of the things when we talk about black history month are there's there's a feeling amongst some people that we're talking about something that is ancient history. Um, and I think uh, I think this story kind of exemplifies because he's only retired uh, just a, a few years ago. and mm -hmm. and so we're, we're we're talking about something that's really contemporary and and it's and it kind of highlights the relevance of what we're doing because, he felt it when he was there, exact quote that, that was read earlier. You know, the only reason you're here is, is the system quota, right? And, and he's still saying that we have work to do. So this is, it's not ancient history. It is a relevant contemporary problem. That's my big takeaway from, from that story right there. Yeah, and, and he has, I mean, he has quite a story, and I would encourage anyone to go out there and, and read about him and, he, uh, I mean, that's quite a command. He is commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, which is no small thing. And U.S. Central Command, which, or Strategic Command, which is, again, no small thing. So that guy, right. I mean, he had it going on. So, All right, let's take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back with round two. Delete, delete. The restaurant industry is a great place to pursue your passion while building a career at the same time. If you like to cook, Enjoy being part of a team and show off your skills? Sign up today for Restaurants Recruit. Restaurants Recruit will directly connect you to restaurant companies looking to hire great military talent and willing to invest in your career. Sign up if you're a veteran, a military spouse, or are getting ready to transition out of the service and are ready for your next big move. It's free and easy. Just go to chooserestaurants.org slash restaurants recruit to get started on a future in restaurants. All right, and in topic number two, we will go to our special guest, Jeff Daly. He's very special, and he's a guest, so that does right. apply here. <laughs> so I, I'm going to read the title of this. It was It's a story uh, from the Timeline website written by Heller, Heather Gilligan. And the title, just alone, Even Nazi prisoners of war in Texas were shocked at how black people were treated in the South. And without getting too deep into the story, because it's a long story, and, and, and they go into things like uh, the, the POWs were allowed to eat in white-only restaurants, and their guards, who were 
uh, black military service members had to wait outside. So the enemy combatants were allowed to eat and the guards who were black had to wait outside. So uh, the story itself is amazing. And there are some, you know, there are some quotes by some of the German soldiers. And the thing that really stuck out to me about this story was more on uh, online. It was posted on a veteran on a veterans page, and th th I want you to th to think about that for a minute. That this was a veterans page, and I saw I saw comments run the gamut, and they were all disturbing to me. Some were seemingly innocent, saying, "Oh, this is this is funny coming from Germans concerning what they did." So basically, someone was trying to deflect because the <laughs> the Nazis had a character flaw of being hypocrites. But if you remember, America was in a moral war. We went over there fighting against what the Nazis stood for. Then the Nazis come to America and they see us doing some of the things that happened early on in the Nazi regime, segregating people into ghettos and, and such. So if we are going to wait the topic on hypocrisy, mm -hmm. there's enough to go around and might I say, might I say, at the time, we might have weighted the scale a little bit more. But then the comments could get, I mean, they ran the gamut. And the one that really struck me to make uh, my, my Facebook rant is that someone said, I am tired of hearing about what black Americans have done, why is race involved in everything? Well, first of all, it was a Black History Month post, so it was topical and timely and relevant to the moment. It wasn't everything. It was a very specific targeted thing. And number two, and I'm a very reasonable person, I searched my soul and my brain and my heart. I came to the level of the person who said it, and I tried to tweak in my head the reasons why someone would say this, and I couldn't find a morsel of any being to care that this person was tired because I am exhausted that we have to still justify our worth and contributions to this country. So if you are tired, I'm sorry, yawn and get over it because I'm exhausted and there is no cure for that currently. And I, I ask you to join me. I ask you to join me in this, this final thing that I'm going to say on this before I open it up is if you are really tired of it, make this, uh, make this pledge with me at uh, February 28th every year. I wish that this was the last time we ever had to go through a Black History Month because I want that more than you do, trust me. But for the people who ask such questions, you answered the question by asking it. So we are not there yet. And I, I encourage you and I invite you to join into the cause of making such a month a moot point. Now, I'm going to go as my grandmother's favorite radio show to the rest of the story. This, uh, what was it? What did that German, what did that German man say that struck me so? He, um, all right, the blacks didn't do much better than us, remarked one POW. They were just in front of the wire. We were behind the wire. Another German soldier who was a farmer in his civilian life noted that the African-American were expected to pick two to three times the cotton required of the POWs. You have to see how they lived, he said. Those people were so exploited. That's a Nazi talking about the United States of America. If that doesn't strike you, you may need to take a really deep introspective look and ask yourself why that doesn't it, strike you. I mean, so. if, you, if you saw this story and your reaction was anything other than this is abhorrent, you, I don't know really. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's not much you could say about this. I, I, I've actually, I think it was a Stephen Ambrose book where he talked about uh, African-American uh, people guarding Germans, and I thought it was in Louisiana, but it might have been Texas. But they talked about how, you know, the POWs, when you think about a German POW in Louisiana and Texas in World War II, it's not like they were in a gulag here. Like, they were allowed to kind of come and go as they wanted. We obviously mm -hmm. kept eyes on them, but they would go out to see movies and stuff, and 
they could sit down front and watch the movie while the black troops had to go up and sit in the balcony. And it's just, there's no other response other than this is preposterous. And I, I don't, it's, yeah. I mean, I think everybody needs to hear it. Just because mm-hmm. you're tired of hearing it doesn't mean you shouldn't hear it anymore. I, I, yeah. I got to agree with Jeff. And doesn't make it any yes, less Jeff, important. you are incredibly yeah. reasonable. I've never, I've never, I mean, you, you go off on your rants and I might agree or disagree with you on 90% of them, but you're always incredibly reasonable. And your take is not dissimilar from my own. Ashley? I concur. I, I One of my takeaways from, from reading this article was that um, in kind of this weird paradox and parallel of, of the world right now, I mean, this is someone's lifetime. Like this is like, you know, uh, even from our, our previous story, right? Cecil was 65 years old, okay? You know, if you really think about this, you just tack on, you know, another, what, 10, 20 years, what, 2000, oh, I'm terrible math. So let's just start from here. So World War II, beginning of World War II, you're looking at the 40s. Like from, this is someone's lifetime that this is happening, right? So when people are always like, oh, well, why are we doing this or why, I'm tired of hearing, right, to, to, to Jeff's point, I'm tired of hearing about this. I'm like, well, if you think about it, we've literally been whitewashing our own history books. And the fact that, you know, the Germans were here, right, and they were getting treated better, as, as Mark said, you know, they're going to these movie theaters, they're basically making this observation, like, you know, we're known for our blatant racism as a Nazi party, but you guys are way worse. You guys are literally segregating your uh, entire population of people who are literally contributing and we're exploiting. And it, that should make you incredibly uncomfortable that this has happened in someone's lifetime. And that, you know, civil rights, that is within a lifetime. Like that affects like our grandparents, right? Our great camp- great grandparents, right? Like think about that. Like that's the time that they lived through and what's so disturbing about this and and overarching is that we're supposed to be the land of the free right i just feel like there's this this inconsistency with what we value and what we believe we say oh we value you're an american you're a human being but we believe only when it's convenient to us or only when it's like you know i'm gonna get back from my rant tangent but you know we're supposed to be teaching the world about democracy and we're the land of the free and we're supposed to be perpetuating these values of, of stoic, humane, and inalienable rights. And we've stripped people of those or we've demoralized or we've, we've whitewashed our stories that we have to have Black History Month. These are Americans. Black Americans. They are Americans, period. And we have a lot of work to do in this country. So that's that was my takeaway from this article. Like, just because it happened maybe before I was born, maybe before my parents were born, doesn't make it any less real or important. So that's my takeaway. There you go. All right, for my top, I've got, uh, we're going to each do a topic in each round today. And as is not uh, uncustomary, uh, I have got the two Medal of Honor recipients. Uh, and actually Jeff picked this one out for me and it's very well done because I have two connections to this guy that I did want to talk about. Uh, of course I, I know. Uh, but I, I would say that, uh, this one is probably my second or third favorite of all time. If you look up Lieutenant Fox, uh, medal of honor recipient from world war two, uh, he called in fire on his own position when he was in a church tower. Uh, he called it in on his own position to help his guys get away and because he wanted to take as many bad guys with him. It's an absolutely phenomenal one. But this one, almost everybody in our viewing audience will know who this is by just my telling you that in the movie Glory, this is the character that was played by Denzel Washington. So just picture Denzel as we read through this. But uh, it's Army Sergeant William Carney, who was in the 54th Massachusetts which is, of course, the greatest state in the country. But uh, he, the, for those who haven't seen Glory, the uh, 54th Massachusetts during the Civil War was a black unit led by white officers. Um, and they fought in a battle in Charleston, South Carolina. They assaulted Fort Wagner, which just happened to be defended by the cadets of the university that I graduated from, the Citadel. So I have two ties to this one. 
Uh, but uh, Carney's regiment led the charge on Fort Wagner, and during the battle, the unit's color guard was shot. Carney, who was just a few feet away, saw the dying man stumble, and he scrambled to pick up the fallen flag. Despite suffering several serious gunshot wounds himself, Carney kept the symbol of the Union held high as he crawled up the hills to the walls of Fort Wagner, urging his fellow troops to follow him. He planted the flag in the sand at the base of the fort and held it upright until his near lifeless body was rescued. Uh, he lost a lot of blood and nearly lost his life, but not once did the flag touch the ground. You know, it's it, it's hard for us to imagine even going through a scenario like this, right? There's gunshots and explosions going off. And not only is all that happening, but at least in a modern firefight, you have a chance to get your pound of flesh. Carney did the one thing that ensured that he wouldn't get any pound of flesh. He just carried the flag. He was given a job and he did it and he did it almost to his, you know, his dying strength. But if you're carrying a flag in two hands, you can't be shooting back at the enemy. So the kind of courage that it takes to do something like that, knowing that everybody on the other side is aiming at the guy with the flag because that lunatic has got to go down like that. That guy's obviously got some stones. So I love the story. He received the Medal of Honor. I think it was in uh, 1900. Uh, yeah, May 23rd, 1900. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Uh, again, uh, Carney, he's just special. Just special. Uh, and uh, I think Super Producer Holly was editing this as I was speaking, but Lieutenant John R. Fox was the uh, Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. If you get a chance, look that one up. I think the... Spike Lee movie about World War II is at least in part based on uh, John Fox. But Jeff, what do you got on Carney? I think I think it's appropriate that you uh, brought up a movie because when you read when you read this story, it reads it reads like a Hollywood script that yes. that someone would just be so overtaken with his patriotism. That he carried, that he, first of all, the person, the reason why he got that is the person who was carrying the flag before him was shot and killed. And then he goes, dives and catches it because he does not want to let it hit the ground. And then knowing, see, after seeing someone get shot carrying it, he carries it while being shot at. And uh, that's, that's amazing to me, that level of patriotism. And I don't think, I don't think we can overlook the fact that he he amassed this level of patriotism in a country where he was born into slavery right in Norfolk Virginia in 1840 and he came from that and got to the level that he would lit I mean we also we all have said we'll die for the flag but he literally almost died for a physical flag and right. that that's that's a Hollywood story to me that's it's amazing. Yeah, agreed. Ashley, I just I think this is incredibly you know symbolic of of Jeff's point. You know, it's it's patriotism at its finest. But you know the the flag was really the the symbol of the Union, and that flag being held up high was a, a symbol of morale and everything that this country could be. And for for Carney to see that potential and understand its its importance not just to himself but to his his fellow you know fellow soldiers i just think it's so meaningful and it's important in that you know everyone doesn't matter your your, your rank or title your position like you know you can make a difference and he saw this flag going down and he just wanted to grab it and he said you know what you know, I, I feel like there's just those split seconds where you're like this is important. You may not necessarily see it in that moment, but I am impressed. Very impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, as super producer Holly is eagerly typing in in the back and waving pictures at us and doing interpretive dance, uh, it actually, the story of, uh, of Carney is actually in our flag book -a -zine, which you can find. It's, in, it's at Emblem Sales. And I know I actually wrote some articles in there, but I don't think I wrote that one. I honestly don't remember. Uh, but if you go to Emblem Sales and look up Indivisible, the story of our flag, mm -hmm. it is awesome. It is a, it was a great like Christmas gift, I think. 
it's a good coffee table book. I like to pick it up and read it every now and again because I like to read things. But it is <laughs> it, it, it when I when I tease uh, editor Jeff Stouffer, it's always from a place of love. This product that he put out, the Flag Bookazine, is one of the best things I've ever seen. It really it's it's amazing. I hear he's done a great job on the coronavirus booklet as well that's coming out. I haven't seen it, but I heard it was phenomenal. And again, we need to tell people out there what we're doing. So there is an ongoing effort. It's not, I mean, Jeff's in charge of the magazine and the website and all these other things. And he still manages to find time to do uh, all these other projects. And apparently that one's going to be available in March. So, and, and, and super just, producer, super producer just to be Holly clear, it's Jeff it herself, So. What's that, Jeff? Just to be clear, it's Jeff Stouffer, not this Jeff. I, no, I don't, Jeff Stouffer. Yeah, I've never did. put out a book in my <laughs> life. <laughs> and it's not going to start now? <laughs> no. Well, let, let's give you a head start here. We're going to take a 30-second commercial break. Jeff, I want, you to, I want you to start work on what your autobiography is going to be entitled because I, I, I want to – the art for it mm. alone should be spectacular. So – all right, we'll take a quick commercial break, and we'll be back in just a couple seconds. Delete, delete. Did you know that you could cut a five-pointed star in one snip? Betsy Ross did. Learn her secret and many other things you might not know about Old Glory in the American Legion's Bookazine, Indivisible, the Story of Our Flag, available at legion.org forward slash emblem sales. All right, we are back for the rapid fire, and today's going to be a little bit different. We're actually going to play some music under the rapid fire stories of black history currently being made. Uh, it's the members of the United States Army Field Band, uh, which and the 82nd Airborne Chorus perform Lift Every Voice. And I did want to say I got one letter this week which was telling me that I was incorrect about most military bands, that they do go to basic training. Uh, not entirely true, but I know that uh, we Jeff and I discussed that the Marine Corps band apparently does not. Uh, but uh, apparently the Army bands do go to basic training with the exception of Pershing Zone and one other. So I apologize. I was not trying to impugn the good name of our military bands. I just, I when you don't really run into them, you know, I guess familiarity breeds something. I, don't, I haven't... Uh, I haven't met them, but either way, uh, I hope you'll enjoy the sounds of Lift Every Voice, which we'll be playing uh, in the background here as we go through these. And we will start today with Miss Ashley. All right. So first up on the docket, um, U.S. Navy's first black female tactical jet pilot. That's right. You heard right. Tactical jet pilot gets her wings of gold. Lieutenant J.G. Madeline Swiegel received her wings of gold and marking a historic historic naval aviation milestone. Uh, Spiegel was named a naval, excuse me, naval aviator and awarded her gold wings, her gold naval aviator wings with 25 classmates during a small ceremony at the Naval Air Station in Kingsville in Texas. So super high speed, not only is she a trailblazer, but she is setting an example and she is a role model and she is hoping to encourage others that she can do it. You can do it. I, I love it. She is super high speed. She, um, uh, yeah, I mean, impressive. Amazing. You go, yeah. girl. Get it. I, d I did want to read this quote real quick from uh, Vice Admiral Miller. And he said, Lieutenant J.G. Swiegel has provided, has proven to be a courageous trailblazer. She's joined a select group of people who were in wings of gold and answered the call to defend our nation from the air. The diversity of that group with differences in background, skill, and thought makes us a stronger fighting force. Couldn't so agree more. That's great. Jeff, number All right. two is to you. All right. Former U.S. Central Command leader Lloyd Austin was confirmed as the next Defense Secretary. A historic vote that makes him the nation's first black chief of the Pentagon. Austin, a four-star Army general who spent more than 40 years in the ranks, was approved by an overwhelming 93-2 to 2 vote in the Senate. During his confirmation hearing, Austin vowed to prioritize making the military a working environment free of discrimination, hate, and harassment for all troops and civilians. If confirmed, I will fight hard to stamp out sexual assault, to rid our ranks of racists and extremists, and to create a climate where everyone fit and willing has the opportunity to serve this country with dignity. Love it. I love yeah. everything about that. 
Yes. And rapid fire number three, retired Colonel Paris Davis may finally receive the Medal of Honor. This is from Task and Purpose. And I should note that I had hoped to be able to discuss how Alwyn Cash was going to get his. Uh, White House, if you're listening, get on the stick, dude. It's about time that Alwyn Cash gets his. But as regards uh, Paris Davis, after years of fighting, one retired Special Forces soldier could finally receive what so many of his special of his fellow soldiers say he deserves, the Medal of Honor. According to a New York Times report, then 26-year-old Captain Paris Davis demonstrated heroism and bravery during a gunfight in Vietnam in June 1965, repeatedly putting himself in harm's way to save wounded teammates. His actions immediately earned him a nomination for the Medal of Honor, which the Army somehow lost, which I've seen him lose quite a bit. When his commander resubmitted it, it was lost once again. Now the fight to get Davis recognized may be nearing the finish line. Acting Defense Secretary Christopher Miller, this is from before, was reportedly personally ordered an ex- expedited review of the lost nomination to be completed by March. So we're coming up on that. Let's hope that we have two back-to-back uh, medals of honor for uh, one for Paris Davis and the other for Alwyn Cash. So that should be coming soon. Guys, uh, shout out. I know Jeff has a shout out. I do not have a shout out, uh, but Jeff, do you have a well, shout I out? Well, I thought first what we we're going to do is do like a, a little recap of what, what, what we yeah, did from we the can, rapid fire. We, I, yeah, I was going to do that after, but yeah, what do you? Oh, I mean, what do you make of all oh. these stories that combine? Well. Like you, you had said, you had said your piece that we, you know we're not there yet, and I agree with you. Um, I mean, well, I, the only other thing I, the only other thing I wanted to add were was I wanted to reiterate that these, this is history in the making. It's not history already written. And mm-hmm. I think it's important that we talk about history that already is written or should have been written, and that we talk about history in the making that it's things that are currently happening. So I was, right. I was, I was happy to have this moment of current things. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. That <laughs> it's we're you know we we're all about the firsts and there's a, still a lot of firsts going on even today. Yeah. Now there shouldn't be. We shouldn't be talking about I mean the first four-star admiral we that should have been, you know, maybe back Washington should have uh, appointed him or something, but you know it is what it is. So if we're still hitting firsts, uh that's not great, but the key thing is that we need to have firsts and then we need to have, you know, people following along so it's right. good uh, in terms of mentorship and everything else if you see a person who looks like you comes from the same background as you i think it helps you to strive to get further along i mean i, I i'm hoping it'll it'll work and we'll and we'll start to see a change on that but uh yeah i'm gonna i do have a shout out uh miss holly is correcting me of course because that's why she she lives to tell me that i've done wrong uh but uh jeff do your shout out and then we will go with mine all right my shout out as i tour this country post to post trying to find things that posts are doing that are awesome i found the harry s foster american legion post 67 in the department of virginia uh this seems to be a predominantly black post and they have a page dedicated to black history and they say black history february 1 through 28 and every day now while i was and they have a lot of they have a lot of cool stories some of them are about their their members and some are about uh the, the stories that we that we tell for uh that we tell here and everywhere else i did spy on one of their stories about uh, a young lady Zaya Holman, the granddaughter of one of their members in Virginia, who is taking her academic and athletic talents to the University of Michigan. Yay, it makes blue. sense. Uh, it makes sense that they would point out such an amazing academic <laughs> achievement that she has done uh, because they focus a lot on child development. If you go to their programs page, they, they these are the things that they list. Boys State, Girls State, Junior ROTC, ROTC, oratorical contests, and junior law cadet programs. They focus on the children. So they're all about black child, black, they're all about black history, but they pair it with a children are the future vibe at Post 67 in Hampton, Virginia. So shout out to them. Awesome. I would, I would note that I think the last 10 governors of Boy State have all been people of color. Uh, I don't know why. 
Uh, like, I don't know how that happened, but I think the last 10, and I know the Department of Virginia really makes it their, their calling to go and find kids that it might be from less privileged areas around the state and get them to Boise State when you have 1,000 kids at Boise State. It's why I'm always proud to go to Virginia Boise State. I think I, I'm, I'm biased and I'm saying this as a legionnaire, not a legion employee, but I love Virginia Boise State. I look forward to it every year. It broke my heart when it got canceled last year. And I did get an email the other day that I've been invited back again this year. So I guess I didn't screw up too bad. So I'll be there for my 16th year, I think. Uh, but for my shout out, I kind of want to go back in time. We are going to be re-releasing one of the first podcasts we ever did, which was a discussion on race and police relations. And it was with three amazing individuals, Sean Powers, Autry James and Hugh Crooks, who are just spectacular people. I I don't want to say it was our best uh, podcast. We've done some pretty good ones. This one was definitely the most meaningful, I think, uh, in terms of it was raw. There was a lot of people, and we're not really sure what we we're going. We're going to be we're not going to be re-releasing it, so to speak. But we will have the link in the show notes. Um, you should definitely go and listen to that. It's uh, it's a little on the longer side, but it, you might be able to hear some things you haven't. Uh, it's yeah, it's a two parter. You might be able to hear some things that that might change your views a little bit. I, I will tell you that uh, as we've alluded to several times, Autry James is one of my favorite people on the planet. He's also one of the smartest men on the planet that I've ever met. Anyway, he's a he's a he's a lawyer. He's a he, he's actually uh, the prosecution in Oakland County. Uh, and he was a cop before that, and he was a soldier before that, and he is guard. Is a coasty, coasty. Oh, he's a coasty. Oh, I, I take back everything I just said about Autry. <laughs> now, Autry is spectacular. He is he's a wonderful. Per- if you ever get a chance to spend time with Autry, spend time with Autry. Once he gets talking, he's a little he's a little reserved, but once you get talking, and he is just he will the best. go. He is the best person to talk to in the world. Love it. So he was. Uh, we're going to be putting that out uh, in the show notes. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to it, you really should. Uh, you owe it to yourself to hear what these guys have to say about a lot of things. And obviously them all being police officers, uh, two of the three being African-American, they have a unique understanding of what's going on. And And uh, Hugh Crooks was, uh, was on the LAPD during the Rodney King beatings, correct? Yes. So he's, he's seen it up close and personal and... And Autry's just Autry. He, you should, you know, <laughs> listen to Autry whenever he speaks. So, Ashley, what you got any parting thoughts? My parting thought in regards to everything that we discussed for this episode is that black history is all year long. And that black history is American history, period. Like, we have work to do, America. It's time to step up. There you go. So, there you go. All right, folks. Well, as always, make sure that you go and you rate us uh, on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcast. Make sure you subscribe, you like us, rate us favorably, we would hope. Leave a review. And as always, as always, Jeff's email remains open. That lovely lady is out there waiting. He is a unique fixer-upper opportunity. Is he perfect? No. Does he look like an African American Shrek? Yeah. But inside, there's a lot of lot of layers to this onion. And ladies, you will cry when you get to the innermost layer that is Jeff Daly. So I've done all I can to sell his love life. It's like ice to an Eskimo here. I think I, you know, I'm doing what I can. I'm doing what I appreciate I can. you. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, As Ashley's actually, rolling her eyes and laughing. Yeah. I appreciate you, Mark Seavey. <laughs> yeah. All right. Folks, we will see you next week. I appreciate you being here, and thank you for listening to us. We'll see you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.